you'll see. Hello, respected viewers. Uh, it's George from Ireland. So uh, this video is about um, uh, university education, um, funding, grade inflation. Uh, it's difficult to come up with a title for it because it's quite broad ranging. But I had a request from one of my many faithful viewers about a few hours ago. So just come back from the beach and time to do this. Um, well, uh, tertiary education has expanded unimaginably uh, over the past century or so. Look at the United Kingdom, one of the most advanced countries in the world. Um, you know, one of the first countries to have to have more or less 100 percent literacy. I mean, some of the German states were sooner and some of the most famous universities in the world. The, that um, is it QSI rankings, the sort of world university rankings. Oxford came top this year, which is a fantastic result. Obviously, the, the UK government ought to be elated about that and then fund Oxford as much as it needs because it's probably the only thing in the world the United Kingdom has got which is world beating, which is absolutely number one. Um, but of course, the government's not going to do that. It's worried about these populists saying, oh, you're funding rich kids and it's snobbish and things like that, um, which is obviously bunkum because people of all social classes can and do go there. Anyway, when we look back to the 1930s, even in the UK, only about 2% of the population went to university, about 2%. Now uh, it's, it's approaching 40%. Um, and the Labour government, when there was one, they wanted the figure to go up to 50%, which was staggering. So um, Republic of Ireland, we got about the highest university participation rate in the world. Again, it's around 50%, um, which I don't think is a boast, and then that's too high. Now, I don't want it down to 2% either. There, there is some sort of uh, via media, of course. Um, so obviously a degree, having a degree is, is, is déclassé. It was obviously more of a distinction when fewer people had one. Now that I know that um, most people thought that university just wasn't an option for them, wouldn't even considered it. We're going right back to the 1930s, uh, time of the Great Depression, people had several children in the family, tertiary education wasn't, wasn't publicly funded, hardly at all. You know, you've got to pay your own fees and unless you come from an upper, upper middle class family, that was ruinously expensive. It was just um, beyond the reach of most people financially. So often they were, the school leaving age in, in the UK and Republic of Ireland at the time was, was 14. So most people had to go out and join the workforce, contribute to the family economy by that stage. Um, anyway, but uh, the fact that the, the number of people who have degrees has risen doesn't mean that the value of it is lower per se if people have, have, have attained that degree by achieving the, the requisite standard, a standard just as exacting as would have been the case in the 1930s. Patently, the standard is obviously not as high as it was. Now, this, this video is going to look at the United States as well. I'm, I'm not so well versed on, on, on third level education uh, in the United States. I know in the US people tend to say college rather than university. So strictly speaking, it's a college if it can award a bachelor's degree, but no higher, and a university if it can award a master's degree or a doctorate. So, you know, if you're a sort of Harvard College, you might be talking about the undergraduate section of Harvard University. Um, okay, well, obviously they can give you everything up to a, up to a PhD there. Um, anyway, so there is merit to the argument that says that uh, a more participation doesn't have to lower standards. In practice, it has. Um, so the United States, well, obviously didn't go around down the UK model of um, publicly funding higher education. And obviously in the last 20 years, the United Kingdom has rode back from that model of uh, taxpayer funding third level education. So there was a Butler report in the United Kingdom in 1943. Sir William Butler, he produced this report at the request of the, of the government. Winston Churchill was prime minister at the time. And obviously the, the um, Second World War was in full, full spring. Butler identified various problems like squalor, ignorance, want, idleness. By want, he meant, um, what would I say? Uh, well, poverty, really, just the lack of things. Not that you desired things, but just that uh, you didn't have the things that you needed. Um, and um, idleness, he didn't mean people just being lackadaisical, but simply being unemployed, just not contributing to the economy because of the Great Depression before the war. But uh, ignorance is what concerns us. Now, Sir William Beveridge, he was master of University College, Oxford, my college. So Oxford University is divided into 39 colleges. Back in the 40s, there were only about 20 of them. So it has no direct equivalent to the American system. Uh, well, a little bit like a fraternity or sorority, but even that's inadequate because you have to be in a college and it's not necessarily about carousing and they don't really have that much of a character. Anyway, you live there for at least your first year and they compete each against each other in sports and things like that. And the different colleges, they all do different, um, they all do all different subjects, more or less. And they're mostly undergraduate colleges, well, with some postgraduates. There are a couple of colleges with postgraduates only. The colleges, they're all mixed now, boys and girls together. In the old days, that wasn't the case. 
Um, so, so William, he was a Liberal MP as well, as a Conservative and Labour, well, and Liberal coalition in the wartime, but they had him produce this report. And the, very ne the next year was the Butler Education Act, and so he was trying to expand uh, secondary education, fund it better, but also third level of ed education, say the government's going to have to contribute more and um, pay people's fees. So uh, if you resident in the United Kingdom, even if, even if you aren't a citizen, if you're resident for at least three years, then you could go to any university in the UK to do any, any bachelor's degree and the government would pay for that. That would include qualifying, qualifying you as a medical doctor, for instance. Um, However, if you dropped out of a degree and you want to start a second one, you had to pay the fees. If you failed the degree and had to leave, you could start a degree again, but you'd have to pay. If you already had a degree, bachelor's degree, and you want to do a second bachelor's degree, you're going to have to pay for the second one. If you had a bachelor's degree, wish to go on to a master's degree, again, you had to pay for that. But bear in mind, very, very few people um, had postgraduate degrees in those days. Postgraduate degrees were largely honorary things, like a doctor of, of civil law, or a doctor of letters, you know, DCL, DLIT, DD, as in a doctorate of divinity. Like um, the substantive PhD in the United Kingdom was only invented before the First World War. A very unusual thing. Obviously, um, doctorates, as we know them, were invented in, in Germany. And then, then the United States, the UK, was a real Johnny come lately to that. The DPhil, Oxford University calls its doctorates DPhil, not PhD. Um, and they were only invented in 1917. So a lot of these um, uh, dons, an academic at Oxford, Cambridge, is called a don, colloquially. It's not rude, but just don, in ordinary parlance. Um, and uh, he would be an undergraduate, and it almost was, almost always was a he, till about the 1950s, and um, try and get your degree, set your exams, and it was almost completely by exams, not by thesis, and you could get a first-class degree, perhaps 10% of people would have got a first-class degree, you could get a 2-1, perhaps 50% of people would get a 2-1, you get a 2-2, two, two, below that, uh, you know, another 20%, the third, another 20%, there was a fourth, a gentleman's fourth, as they used to say, or, or you would fail altogether. There is such a thing as a past degree. I'll come on to that. So almost everyone would get an honours degree. You can buy your name, say, BA, ONS, ONS for honours. So getting honours is not special in the United Kingdom or the Irish Republic. Virtually everyone has a degree, has an honours degree. A past degree is you almost fail. You are that close to failing. They'll give you a degree, now go away and never show your face again. Um, or indeed you fail, but they let you resit. And the highest you get is a third. If you can do that well, they'd give you an honours degree. Um, uh, sorry, they give you a past degree, rather. Um, but they're very, very unusual. Um, right, so what was I going to say? So if supposing you've got a first-class degree, your college doctor, Cambridge, would say, oh, well, you're bright enough, so you can start lecturing straight away. They'd offer you a fellowship. Fellowship is mm, sort of being a member of the governing body of the college. Um, it's quite complicated. It wasn't just dons. It wasn't just those who taught in the college. The chaplain, even if he didn't teach would be one. The college bursar, as an accountant, he would be one. Maybe some of the porters, as in security guards, various various people, maybe big donors to the college or distinguished uh, graduates of the college might be part of that as well. And, OK, Oxford and Cambridge were providing almost half the tertiary education in the United Kingdom at the time. You know, Scotland had about four universities. Northern Ireland had one. Queen's Wales at the University of Wales, with campuses at Cardiff, Swansea. Aberystwyth, maybe elsewhere, and there were the major cities in the UK, well in England, had universities like, you know, Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield, Newcastle, Birmingham, and so forth. Um, anyway, so, so Butler envisaged a major expansion of tertiary education, particularly because obviously science was so expensive to do. But universities were never state-owned, so you had to have a charter to set it up. Obviously, universities were originally ecclesiastical foundations, and they were... Um, almost outside the, the, the remit of the government, which is why, um, say, Oxford University had its own police force until 2000. Colloquially called the Bulldogs, and certainly the 1920s, had their own prison. I can show you where it was, being in prison there briefly. German universities, likewise. Read Mark Twain about tramping around um, Germany in the 19th century. Um, and um, because they were semi-independent of the state. Um, but obviously this, this diminished, especially the, the ones that were founded after the Reformation. So he thought, uh, Butler thought there'd be, there'd be no diminution of quality by expanding tertiary education. A bit later, it was um, uh, Evil and War, that novelist said, no, we mustn't expand the number of places in, in university education. More means worse, he said. He was a crashing snob and a reactionary. I think it was Evil and War who said in the 1950s about the Conservative government, the trouble is the Conservative Party hasn't turned the clock back one minute because he was nostalgic for his youth in the 1920s, pining for that. Read Brideshead Revisited, said to be the classic Oxford novel, published in 1945, very elegiac, 
um, starts in 1921, really, the year he went up to Oxford um, and takes us through the Second World War, this fictional character, but it's semi-autobiographical. So you've got to remember just how limited um, third level education was in most countries until very recent times, until 50 years ago, perhaps. So in England, until 1828, there were only two universities, Oxford and Cambridge. Then University College London was founded um, on Gower Street, London, godless Gower Street, because it had no religious denomination. Jeremy Bentham, it was his brainchild. The, the philosopher wanted to see one that was open to people of all religious denominations and none. Um, there have been, been brief attempts set up at the University of London under Cromwell. In the Middle Ages, there even been Northampton University. Um, it was halfway in between Oxford and Cambridge, Northampton. So Ireland, we had universities in 1592, Trinity College, Dublin. Um, but yeah, the, uh, Scotland had four universities, some of them dating back to the Middle Ages. But just because they're more, it doesn't mean that they were better, or the standards could have been lower, could have been higher. Actually, in the 18th century, the standards in the English universities were quite dismal. There were always some um, gifted and diligent undergraduates there, but some of them were just um, upper-class boys who saw it as a finishing school, would go there for, for debauchery, spend more of their time hunting, gambling, um, uh, and so on, um, than they would on their studies, or even without a degree. There's no disgrace in that. Um, into, the, into the early 20th century, people would go to university for a year or two, sit few of any exams and not have any thought of having a degree. To have any experience of university education was a, a greater distinction in those days. Um, you know, so the, the, the princes of the British royal family, certainly from Edward VII onwards, would go to university for a year and leave and never have any intention of sitting finals. Lord Mountbatten, likewise, in these days obviously would be considered a disgrace, but back then there was no shame in it. Um, but obviously we're far more concerned with qualifications with certificates these days. It was all very rough and ready, very pleasingly informal back then, even to qualify as a barrister. Any from the sort of the 1860s onwards, people actually had to sit exams. Previously, they just would have been a pupil, hang around with a barrister, as in a lawyer, an established one, be his pupil, assisting him for about a year, generally recognise, yes, he knows his stuff, okay, you're a barrister, you can be called to the bar. Um, so, yeah, university education expanded considerably after the Second World War, and... Um, some of these undergraduates coming up, they'd been in the they'd been in the army or the Royal Navy, the RAF, and so they had they were not they were not teenagers. They were into their mid twenties in some cases. Likewise, in the United States, um, and the GI Bill came in. GI, I think, general issue, as in for the ordinary soldier, marine, airman, sailor, and so on. Um, and so the university the university education is going to be funded for them. Though apparently African Americans were excluded from that for, for some time. So by the 1960s in the UK, only 4% of young people going to university. This is 1963, 4%. That was a lower figure in the UK than it was for African-Americans, a group who were excluded from a lot of higher education in the United States. Some colleges in the US at the time were openly racist and would reject non-white applicants. Some of them would do it more covertly. Some would take very, very few indeed. Um, you know, uh, Woodrow Wilson, the only president of the United States to have a PhD, when he was president of Princeton, he refused some African-American applicants saying, your gentleman's desire for education is unwarranted. Well, at least he called them gentlemen, but what a, what a vile racist attitude. And there's a move to rename that school of government named in his honor. Now, I know he was a bigot. This was a major flaw on his part, but I think they should still have that named after him. Try and judge him as a man of his time. This is over a century ago when unfortunately these racist attitudes were, were still common, even amongst highly educated people. Um, anyway, so harumphing, war means worse in Auburn War. So universities were meant to be expanded without any sacri sacrifice of, of quality. Um, but anyway, we're going to see that in time, standards thrown out altogether. But it's a good thing that, that working class people who've been almost completely shut out of third level education were finding it accessible. There were always scholarships, okay, but there were few and far between. You had to be really exceptional. The Scottish universities were better at including proletarians. Previously, it was very, very difficult to go to third level education unless you had serious family money. Very difficult to stay in, in school till, till the end of your teens. Um, anyway, so the whole degree classification system, certainly the United Kingdom, only started around 1800. Prior to that, you're awarded a degree or not. And, you know, degrees were all by viva voce, the, the exams, as in spoken exams. The oral would be in Latin. Um, whatever the subject, it would be in Latin. But of course, we didn't really distinguish between the subjects. You'd be learning everything through Latin, maybe some ancient Greek, but um, you'd be learning history, philosophy, medicine, law, whatever, all the lectures in Latin, many of the academic books in Latin. Only in the 18th century, they start to write them in English. Um, and, uh, 
yeah, you, to go up to Oxford and certainly to the uh, 1960s, you had to sit exams in Latin, Greek and, and maths. And you haven't, hadn't done this, gone to a school which taught, taught you loads of Latin and indeed ancient Greek. Forget it! So that, that was dropped. You did need Latin for some subjects, Latin O-level, even for history until the 1980s. Now, other British universities were, were not so um, uh, fuddy-duddy. Um, so the, the degree system has really, has really been degraded. I was going to say that uh, more and more firsts are being awarded at a ridiculous pace is expanding, and two ones. Um, so full disclosure, I got a two out of my first degree. That's, well, almost 20 years ago. Um, I did a bachelor's degree in law, got a 2-2 in that, and I did a master's degree in linguistics, got a 2-2 in that. Now, obviously, if I had done the, my, my bachelor's degree 20 years earlier, probably would have got a 2-2. I don't think I would have failed it. Um, whereas my law degree, if I'd done it, uh, you know, 10 years earlier, probably would have got a third. If I'd done it now, I might get a 2-1. Where my, my linguistics degree, you know, I shouldn't even been admitted to do that degree. That was a master's degree. And um, master's degrees used to be pass-fail, possibly distinction. Or at Oxford, you have to get a 2-1 in all elements of a master's degree to pass. If you, in some of the exams, you get a 2-1 or a first, but if, even if one of them, you get a 2-2, that's it. You failed the whole thing. So very exacting standards. Um, so now the UK has got over 120 universities, 120. So mass producing tons of degrees, but for lower and lower standards. Not being demeaning towards people in their teens or early 20s, there's still some very brainy people and there's some very industrious students so not sneering at them like that. And the people who get first who absolutely deserve them. And the same two ones and blah, blah, blah. The trouble is some people are awarded first who do not deserve them. Some people are awarded two ones, even two twos, whatever, who do not deserve them. And some don't deserve a degree at all. Um, so, and, and then the people who really merit a first or whatever, or a two one, they're hidden amongst the mass who don't. So it's unfair on everybody, and then it overrates people. There's no use telling people they're all very brainy. Prince Edward had his Cambridge fees paid by the Royal Marines on the promise of future service. He lasted two months, or did the family pay the fees back? Good question. Well, the thing is, there were no fees in those days in Cambridge. This is the 80s. That was about 1982 he went up, been to Gordonson School. Um, and, um, yeah, so he was the, the, the RT one of the royal family, not cut out for military life. So before he arrived up at Cambridge, his junior common room passed a motion to say that uh, Prince Edward shouldn't be allowed in, that uh, this is unfair, they should take a working class boy instead. So pretty daunting starting university, especially if the people in your college have said they don't want you. Anyway, he manfully went up, he got his degree at two, one of memory serves, and then he went on to train to be a Royal Marines officer, about the only family in the United Kingdom where the boys are told, you must join the armed forces, your mother's a commander in chief. So he did, and he couldn't hack it, training to be a Royal Marines officer, he, he dropped out after two months. He might have got some stipend when he was an undergraduate, because if you signed up to join the armed forces, then you get some money to live off but whilst you're there. But then you do have to go in your holidays, do some military training. So presumably whilst an undergraduate, you had to go and train with the Royal Marines. But when he was doing the actual full-time course, he dropped out of that. Now he couldn't take it, I couldn't take it, most of us couldn't. We don't have the mental toughness, we're not physically fit, all the rest of it. So this is the thing about being a prince is, or princess, is your life is not your own really, even your private life. And if you ever mess up, everybody's gonna know about it. And there was the headline, Wimp of the Windsors. OK, one thing I heard about Royal Marines training, this was going on in the 90s. I'm not certain this is true. On the first day, the NCOs are training these guys would say, right, everybody face down in the mud, in the puddle, right? And the instructors stand over them and piss on them. Just to show you are worthless. You will do absolutely anything we say. You are dirt. You have to earn our respect. Only if you can prove you can hack it. Only then do you get treated with the modicum of respect. And um, then it shouldn't surprise people. Unfortunately, some British soldiers did that to Iraqi detainees. Um, anyway, these days, um, undergrads may well complain if they don't get a 2-1 or a 1st. And, you know, some academics have told me this. It must be the Don's fault. They must have been poorly taught. But just occasionally they are poorly taught. But couldn't it possibly be because the undergraduate lacked aptitude or application? Now, um, it's obviously very difficult to become an academic. Like, a PhD is now sine qua non for an academic career. And there are other qualifications in being an academic teacher there. In the old days, you can just do it. You got a first. Um, and the qualification of inflation, more people have to have PhDs. If too many people have bachelor's degrees, then to be distinguished, you have to have a master's degree. If too many have a master's, you've got to have a PhD and a postdoc. And where does it end? Two doctorates? Um, so that's the prerequisite now for um, uh, being a lecturer is having a PhD. Um, so 
No, I think they're very poor. Very few university teachers are bad. And the thing is, you should largely teach yourself. At undergraduate level, you should be autodidactic. You've developed the self-study skills. Grow up. And um, that's it. You've got to take responsibility for your own learning. The academics have almost no responsibility for that. So um, their main job is really to research and not to teach. Teach is almost incidental. Some of the dons would even resent the undergraduates being there or the postgraduates there, have to supervise doctoral or theses occasionally. So this, this necessity of uh, obtaining a, a PhD is, is surely another symptom of great inflation. So um, anyway, it wasn't so long ago some dons didn't have them. And when I was an undergraduate in the 90s, they were, there were still a few dons who were playing Mr. or indeed Miss, and there are probably none of them left these days. Um, because if you notice, if someone's got a double first, you know he or she is bright enough anyway. Can't they commence teaching right away? Um, so, yeah, grade inflation is real, but there are other factors. OK, it's more competitive. Perhaps people are trying harder. If you go back to the 80s, you've had a degree in anything. You're a member of a small minority. Getting a well-paid white-collar job was almost guaranteed. But that's no longer the case. So you can't just get a third. You've got to get higher ones um, to, get, to get anywhere. So um, a degree is not a passport even to a poorly paid job these days. Many people are doing non-graduate jobs. There's only going to be a limited number of professional jobs. So um, we now call any occupation profession. It's not. A profession is for those who have a, have a certain high standard of education, have to qualify. OK, like journalism is a trade. Anyone who's paid for, to, to, for their reportage or their commentary is a journalist. Um, whereas a trade would be, let's say, architecture. I can't design a building, even I'm brilliant at it, and give you a, a design that would work. I'm not allowed to, because you, you have to qualify and be part of this professional body. So now we don't talk about failure, we talk about deferred, deferred success. I read some universities have been doing that since 2002. Um, so academics are told to massage their grades. We don't want complaints. They massage them rather than roughly. They got a whip on their backs from top management. Don't upset these good customers. Keep the fees rolling in. So the question is, where's the money to come from? Now, in the UK, in the early 80s, only 10% of young people went to university. This is when Margaret Thatcher became prime minister. And then there was, we didn't have to pay a penny in fees and uh, you got a grant to live off. Even though your parents are millionaires, you got a grant to live off. And it was enough to live off. Not well, but it was doable. And then the number of people at university grew and grew and grew. And it was unaffordable to, to um, keep paying so much. And obviously it came to the crunch in the late 90s when the Blair government, just as they came, had a serious look at higher education funding and decided they were going to have to bring in fees. And first of all, it was £1,000 a year. But for the top, if you're the top third of incomes, your parents in the middle third has been become less and less and less, um, right down to just paying one pound a year. I even paid somebody's fees for him at university against his will. It was like three pounds, and the, the the university was delighted to receive it. And this boy was irritated because it had taken away his ability to protest in that sense. But you know, you you chose to get university. You knew the fees are required. You pay them, or you get kicked out. That was my view. So I'm not against those in principle. And then there came three thousand pounds top-up fees, now they're up to £9,000. The university can set them anywhere from, from 6000 to 9000 And the thing is, then you don't have to pay up front, you can just go. The other thing is, people's parents were held responsible for them. Now, you could say that's unfair. They're 18, that's it, they've flown the nest. You're an adult, you take responsibility for yourself. What if you're against your child being going to university? Well, I don't agree with that attitude, but fair enough. And what if they're doing a worthless degree, or is it a rubbish university? You shouldn't have to pay for something you don't agree with. And you might have more children. I want to speak, you know, the parents' responsibility does end at some point. Legally, it should end. You might say morally it shouldn't, but there you are. It's unfair on the parents who might want to save for their own old age. And they might have several younger children they need to provide for. So you're an adult. You're choosing to go to university. So you should, you should pay your own fees. If your parents are willing to pay your fees, fine. But I don't think we should legally oblige parents to do so. Um, Anyway, at this rate, with great inflation, every single undergraduate will be awarded a, a first within 30 years' time. This is preposterous. And, you know, the bottom has dropped out of standards. As I say, there are very able, intelligent and hardworking undergraduates who deserve these things, postgraduate students who deserve master's degrees with distinctions, and likewise people doing doctorates. But it's not a huge number. It never was. It never shall be, Okay. Our talent's kind of limited. People are perhaps being more effectively taught. There's a lot of teaching to test at school level. This malaise goes on into school level as well. 
Now, you can see the American system where obviously there, there are public colleges where the fees are fairly low, but even those have risen considerably. And the, the, the fees are just ruinous at top colleges, like say $50,000 a year quite easily. Well, there's tuition, board, you've got to pay for books and blah, blah, blah. And so people um, graduate $100,000 in debt quite easily going um, to some of these top uh, Ivy League colleges. And then the thing is that, that that degree is almost worthless on its own. You have to do an internship, probably unpaid. And if you can live off your mum and dad, it's a lot more doable to be an intern at a law firm or a bank or something like that. Um, and if you live, if your parents live in a big city, even they're not giving you money to live off, then you could live with them for a while. Um, whereas they live in the middle of nowhere, your opportunities are very limited. So you see there's a very unlevel playing field. Um, and what else? Then, then you've got to get, go to graduate school, you've got to get a master's degree because a bachelor's degree on its own is almost worth as a stepping stone to something else. So I see what the problem is. Then people have got to pay off this enormous debt. What a millstone around your neck embarking on adult life. Um, and uh, so they are um, pressurized into going into handsomely handsome remunerated occupations like banking or something, um, which are not, or not necessarily that socially useful. OK, they make a ton of money, but this person might say, well, I want to be a teacher or something like that, or I want to be an aid worker. They're never going to make much money. I want to be a social worker, um, which is just helping um, needy people. OK, but you're going to be in debt all your life. And then you're trying to get a mortgage or something like that and have children. And a lot of these um, people who say well, there should be no government funding for third level education. Well, um, look at this. You're very anti-abortion, most of these people. And it's a respectable position. I have a lot of sympathy for that. But uh, supposing that, let's say, a young woman becomes pregnant and she's, you know, $100,000 in debt. If she wasn't in debt, she'd be rather less likely to have that abortion, thinking, uh, you know, I can provide for this child. I, I'm not, I won't be ruined. Or a young man, it's, it's his girlfriend or even his wife becomes pregnant and he might be saying to her, well, we really can't afford this baby uh, because, you know, we're so, so much in debt. If they didn't have six figures of debt, they'd be less likely to go for that abortion. So if it saves even one life, isn't it worth doing? If life is sacred for you, funding higher education. Um, okay, so... Um, Thatcher, go back to Thatcher in the UK, and uh, in the 1980s she said more undergraduates partly to hide youth unemployment, and unemployment hit 15% under her. So sort of a non-violent version of the Cultural Revolution, saying undergraduates are customers, must be viewed as customers, must get value for money, and okay there were a few idle dons who taught badly or were late, cancelled tutorials and so on. Tutorial is a small discussion group. Well at Oxford it's like two or three with a don, occasionally even one on one. But uh, the, the groups have expanded, expanded, and at the provincial universities, as in anything that's not Oxford and Cambridge, a tutorial that have like a dozen people there. Now, I know someone who went to Southampton University in the 90s and, you know, writing like three essays a uh, term, send them off, get them marked, give them back to her, never meet the Don who did that. So it's, it's ludicrous. So universities don't have enough money to employ enough people to keep the undergraduates busy. Doing something like medicine or dentistry medicine, that's uh, dentistry or veterinary medicine, these subjects, they really do keep you busy. It's like having a full-time job. It really is 40 hours a week between lectures and labs and tutorials and all the rest of it. And loads of exams. Now, almost everybody fails a few of those exams. They're given many, many chances. So um, there's a big change to say, you know, they are viewed as customers and then the universities are afraid of them, don't want to upset a valued client. So there's a system called UCAS, University and College um, uh, Admission Service. You apply through UCAS. In the UK, you can only apply to six universities a year. It could be rejected by all six. Um, or it could be rejected by six, accepted by one, decide to turn it down, apply again next year, apply to another six. So you can apply to six a year. Admittedly, if one rejects you this year, you can say, I'm not going anywhere, and apply again next year, including to that one that rejected you the previous year. Um, anyway, I think the fundamental mistake was to regard universities as chiefly part of the economy. Now, there's some economic benefit in having people who can think, but primarily it's about education for its own sake. It's supposed to be about learning, not earning. If you want to make money, go and get a well-paid job. Now, um, attaining a superb education and getting a handsomely rewarded job are compatible. But they don't necessarily, one doesn't have to lead to the other. Um, you could um, uh, be a superbly highly educated person and completely unmaterialistic and want to be a monk and want to be a whatever, a poverty-stricken philosopher or whatever, what, um, it doesn't have to be necessarily about money. Or you could be an entrepreneur who has no qualifications whatsoever and makes a packet. And we often hear these stories, but th that is very rare. That's very much the exception being like Sir Richard Branson. But anyway, Thatcher was all profit and loss. She was a bit too much into 
you know, capitalism, I mean, I'm into capitalism up to a point, she didn't seem to regard education having an inherent value. What about civilization? Does it just make it us more human to be better informed, to uh, be more logical, um, to be able to reason things out? Um, universities so ought to be about cultural richness, not material richness, uh, primarily. So if you want to be educated, you go to university. Um, but don't mistake the primary purpose of, uh, of university, which is providing education. Now, um, she was uh, suspicious of academics, thinking them as Marxists, and a few were Marxists. People regard them, you know, universities sometimes as left-wing madrasas. And again, there's an element of truth to that. There were some Marxist dons, or there was notoriously, it was Christopher Hill. He was master of Balliol College, Oxford, and so on. So these far-left people are treated with most extraordinary indulgence, when obviously if they'd had their way, there wouldn't be academic freedom. Um, whereas we don't have far-right figures running colleges or universities. I'm not calling for that, but I don't think it should be banned. And that's like, you know, undergraduates have been members of the BNP. They've been moved to expel them from universities. I'm not aware it's actually happened. Although there were some um, law undergraduates at Exeter University a couple of years ago, and they were in some WeChat group, and they made some racist comments and cracked some jokes about slavery. Unpalatable, I know, but they shouldn't have been sent down for it. People should be allowed to say things that most people find highly distasteful. And that's, that's what freedom is. It's upsetting to people sometimes. Anyway, so a few universities were self-serving and unproductive. All right, but Thatcher went way too far. Not all dons were um, uh, idle and uh, hostile to her agenda necessarily. So there were a few bibulous dons who cared for claret and conversation more than actually lecturing the undergraduates or even research. And because it was a sinecure, once you got this as a job for life, some of these fellowships were designed by competitive examination. Uh, anyone with a bachelor's degree could come and sit this exam to be a philosophy don or whatever, a theologian. So some people who were superb at sitting exams were no good at research or rubbish at lecturing. So there were problems about that. And um, so uh, some of these dons saw as little more than, than uh, a club with loads of freebies. Well, there's Old Souls College, Oxford. So... If you, if you uh, graduate from Oxford, you can be um, invited to be vibed for All Souls. Well, All Souls College, as in uh, founded by Henry VI, for the, all the souls of the soldiers killed in the, in the Hundred Years' War, ending in 1453. And it's a graduate-only college, so there'd be two people from each subject graduating each year be invited, as in two people graduated in history, two people graduated in, in, in Oriental Studies, two people graduated in Theology, two people graduated in um, Modern Languages, something like that. So it'd be only about 20 people or whatever. And of those two, they, of those sort of 20 or so who, who sat the exam, they would then, they would then um, pick the top two and they would be the fellows of all souls. So an extraordinary intellectual distinction. A bit, 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 bit like being part of l'Académie Française. I mean, I know someone who sat for all souls and they had to write a three-hour essay and they're given one word, no question, one word, value. Write about that for three hours and so, some dinner as well that they have to eat as part of the selection process. So men and women are all souls. And for seven years, you have a room, you have a stipend, like 30,000 pounds to live off. You can live in the college, you can live anywhere, come and go as you please, ideally producing some academic work in that time, but nothing's actually expected. You could have a lectureship in addition to that, as you wish. And then some dons get to be all, the fellows of all souls through other, uh, other means. So... Um, Universities were treated like a nationalised industry, even though they were never state-owned and often weren't actually founded by the state, certainly not the oldest ones. Um, so I, I think she, 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 the rot set in un, under her, uh, although she did. And then uh, Oxford University was very hacked off with her. Um, so um, the prime ministers in the UK who were graduates of Oxford University were traditionally awarded a, um, an honorary doctor by, the, doctor by the university. And... Oxford University chose not to award her one, just to give her two fingers for screwing up third-level education as they saw it. Um, now, then uh, John Major became Prime Minister after her. Now, he had a man with no experience of higher education, probably the least educated Prime Minister of modern times. James Callaghan left school at 16, but had a great appreciation for education, was a widely read man, uh, and was very eager his children to have a superb education, and, and he, he felt... It pained him, it embarrassed him that he didn't go to university. And so when, he, when Callaghan became Prime Minister, he said, Prime Minister never even went to university. Well, Major had no such respect for erudition. Um, anyway, when, when Major became Prime Minister, there were about 40 universities in the UK and a further 40 polytechnics. A polytechnic could award a bachelor's degree, but no higher. Polytechnics were mostly for technical subjects like technical drawing, could be woodwork, metalwork, cookery, makeup, kinesthesiology, 
hairdressing, uh, hospitality, plumbing, things like that, um, draftsmanship. But major, 1992, decided a major overhaul. Those 40 polytechnics were all raised to university status. In most British cities, there, were, there are now two, two universities. One will be the old university, as in it was a university prior to 1992. The other will be a new university, as in it used to be a polytechnic prior to 1992. Take Oxford, there's Oxford University, the famous one. There's Oxford Brooks University, which is the former polytechnic. Glasgow University, and there's Glasgow Caledonian University, which is a former polytechnic. Um, Manchester University and Manchester Metropolitan University, which is the former polytechnic, and on and on. The one with the longer name is the erstwhile polytechnic. So um, he hugely diminished the value of third level education. So uh, way more universities, uh, but no, but and and in real terms less funding per head. Grants to the undergraduates were cut. So what a staggering ignoramus he was. At a stroke, he really degraded third level education in the UK. So printing more, more degrees doesn't enrich us all educationally any more than printing more money would enrich us financially. It leads to inflation. So, um, and the thing is, we're, we're debased the currency of it by not holding people to the same standard. And there are ways you can try to gauge the quality of an essay or maths work and just how challenging it is. And I heard this about like Nottingham University giving a test to their first year undergraduates every year for the same years, and the result goes down and down. And less is expected of people. And I've taught in schools where we had to give people percentages and then was, was told to give them ridiculously high ones. Hello, Sylvia Wong. This is about higher education, funding, standards, qualification, inflation. Um, so, uh, yeah, there the, are the ways we can, we can judge the quality of academic work by, by objective criteria. So I don't advocate returning to the 1930s with a tiny number of people going on to third level education, but there must be a happy medium in between the preposterous situation which we find ourselves these days, where almost anyone could award a water degree and a situation whereby um, third level education was out of the reach of the great majority of people. In the early 80s, we had it about right. So uh, it's ludicrous in the United Kingdom that the universities can choose which class of degree to award. First class degree and the second class degree, which is a very wide class, so it's divided into 2-1 or 2-2, third class degree, fourth class degrees, certainly in Oxford were abolished in the 1960s. Um, I remember, I think it was, I think it was yeah, Evelyn War and Brideshead Revisited saying, saying this Cousin Jasper, the grand remonstrance, a famous passage from that celebrated novel in which Cousin Jasper says to Charles Ryder, you want a first or a fourth. Um, time spent on a good second is time thrown away. And I have a feeling till the 60s they didn't even have the signature between a 2-1 and a 2-2, which is a second class degree. And that's, that was the most typical result. So it's, there's clearly a conflict of interests in the UK where universities can award more and more and more firsts and two ones and fail virtually nobody because it looks best for them. Their league tables, that was another thing, like a football league table, the more goals you score, the more matches you win, the more you move up. But the, the, the teams are at least fighting against each other. They can't both win a match. They can both draw, but they can't win both. They can't lose both. But in this case, there's a perverse incentive award more degrees, go up the league table, or award more first-class degrees and so on. Well, why wouldn't you? Everybody else is doing it, is fiddling the system. So it's crazy to be able to grade yourself like that. It'd be like me being allowed to set my own salary. Uh, what could possibly go wrong there? Um, so, um, and then students say, well, they award first very easily. They must be good or they must be easy if you're wise. So people don't like being told this. It's the whole all must have prizes fallacy. Um, it's like um, Garrison Keeler wrote in, in, in Lake Wobegon, hello from sunny Ireland, RJ's bar humbug. Um, and, and Garrison Keeler said, the average is high in this school and all the children above average. It's, it's that level of um, insanity, just nonsensical. So um, you'd be a fool not to fiddle the system as a university because everybody else does. And if you're an undergraduate, you see, well, you know, she got a third, she complained, they bumped it up to 2-2, two, two. I'll do likewise. Well, I, I'd, be, I'd be foolish not to. Everybody else is exploiting the system. If you bang your fist on the table, they'll cave in. They don't want to upset you. They want you to leave. They want your fees. They want you to persuade other people to join the university. And it's a business and keep money rolling in. And some cities in the UK, for example, um, University of uh, sorry, Liverpool, see universities as part, just part of the economy, bringing in students from overseas, particularly China. That's why in Liverpool, there's Liverpool University, Liverpool John Moores University, and Liverpool Hope University. Three universities in a not very large city. So how do you attract students to the university? Provide superb education from outstanding academics. 
um, and have fantastic facilities, that'd be one way. But there are less noble strategies, things which are not quite so morally uplifting or indeed uh, educationally um, beneficial. So awarding as many high class of degrees as possible, not failing any students, no matter um, uh, how idle or how incapable, giving them freebies, handing out a free laptop. OK, that is educationally help helpful, but there's no such thing as a free lunch. These undergraduates since since 99 have been going into debt, you know, £9,000 a year. And that's just tuition, obviously living, living expenses on top of that. So easily graduating £40,000 in debt. Now, you don't have to pay the, the fees up front. You can pay it back later. You only have to start paying it back when your income reaches a certain level. I think it's £15,000, paying back a tiny, tiny amount. Any, anything that hasn't been repaid after 25 years is written off. If you hadn't paid back a penny after 25 years, it'll be written off. It doesn't count you against you when applying for a mortgage, I know. Now, you could just simply leave the country, and some gifted people have done that in a way, a way to avoid paying it. They still chase you, but there's nothing they can do about it to make you repay. Um, so people are burdening themselves with tens of thousands of pounds of debt, and in some cases, it scarcely enhanced their, um, ed their, their edu employment prospects at all. So um, the, the, go the government um, estimates um, one third of this debt will never be repaid. So we say, oh, it's really helping us economically and it doesn't count as part of the deficit, but it is part of the deficit. It's taking away money from the National Health Service, the armed forces, from pensions, from everything. Um, so we'd be able to pay to spend more on that, cut taxes, pay, do loads of things um, if we didn't have so many undergraduates. So we should have expanded universities in the 80s, but it's gone much too far. So as I say, I'm not demeaning people a generation junior to me. Um, they're just as much, many um, uh, very clever and very hardworking students as ever there were. Um, but their, their achievements should not be, be belittled. But there are others who awarded classes degrees which they shouldn't get. People who are limited to third level education who shouldn't be there at all. Um, anyway, so a lot of money is squandered on glossy advertising, on public relations. I know someone who works in university PR on big, big billboards. If you have to advertise to beg people to come, you mustn't be that good then. Your reputation should speak for itself. And I found this, the least distinguished ones will have the jazziest logos and pay for the most adverts on the radio, on television, on the internet, or even the railway station, the town. It's the home of wherever or wherever university and some really tacky slogan like whatever. Rapid results here or the college for real winners or something ludicrous like that. Um, and there are even brochures uh, saying how fun our undergraduate life is. That's nice. But saying there's so many one night stands. No, I'm not. I'm not being judgmental about promiscuity. I like to do it myself. I'm simply saying that should not be part of, of a university's pitch. So um, anyway, treating universities as businesses is just fundamentally wrong. We need a complete attitudinal change. The approach has been stack them high and sell them cheap, a sort of Dutch auction on standards. So they are cheap in the sense that they're easy to get. Conversely, their price is going up. Remember Ron Paul, that Republican senator making the same observation in the United States, the price has gone up and the quality has gone down. And some of the academics are abysmally paid, You're much better off as a school teacher, even though you're less qualified. But the chancellors, the vice chancellors, the, the, some of the administrators get these whopping astronomical salaries. So uh, maintenance grants have gone. And maintenance grants, I know the problem was, even if your parents were millionaires, you still got it. Come on, they could afford to pay for you. Should they be legally obliged to pay for you? I'm minded to say not. But anyway, the new system was really going to target at people from low-income families. And there is some logic and justice to that, rather than splurging on those who don't need it as well. So the amount of money the government spends on undergraduates has gone down and down. Paradoxically, the government's degree of control has increased and increased, and they're demanding this and that for universities. But we're told the results are better than ever. But do you smell a rat? We're going to spend less, get more. It doesn't make any sense, does it? It's utterly impossible. So to have a superb quality third level education, you obviously have to have fantastic dons, have to pay enough to attract them. Never a highly paid occupation, shouldn't be hugely highly paid, should be reasonably highly paid, somewhat keep pace with the learned professions. Because I knew some very talented dons who left one went off to become a become an accountant saying, yeah, fantastic, wonderful lifestyle, but the money is just abysmal. So we mustn't immiserate our dons. And there's been obviously a brain drain, some of them going to the United States where they can be paid triple the salary. Um, anyway, so uh, so many problems. How to get, yeah, get an excellent, excellent higher education is pay, pay people more, have enough dons so there's a bit of individual attention, exacting, demanding, make it difficult to get in, make people strive to get in, give them enough reasonably difficult work, standards, be willing to give lower grades, be willing to fail people, be willing to kick people out. Uh, and that's that. So really rigor in academia 
and great facilities with superb libraries, online libraries, whatever you need, labs for the scientific subjects. So um, people are going to say, we paid for our degrees, we have to pass. And not just pass, I want a first. Um, and the thing is, you can't buy a brain. And so people feel if they pay for it, they should get it, which is, is no. You haven't, paid, you haven't paid to get it, you paid to get the opportunity to earn it, but you must earn it. So academic freedom is under attack. Woe betide some academic who says people don't deserve these degrees and some people have been sacked for saying just that. And people should be able to follow the evidence wherever it leads, including saying that this is a highly controversial, even about politically charged subjects, philosophy, history, sociology, things like that. There was this um, ridiculous Rhodes Plus Fall campaign at, at Oxford. I was pleasantly surprised when Oxford University showed some backbone and did not remove his statue. Now, you might despise Rhodes and think he was absolutely sick and foul, but that doesn't mean that his statue should be removed. Some of these snowflakes demanded the removal of this statue of the 19th century imperialist. Now, if you found him that offensive, you shouldn't have applied to Oxford. You know that statue's been up there for a century. Um, anyway, we shouldn't bow the knee to these bully boy tactics. The safe spaces, the trigger warnings in lectures, uh, that's ridiculous. Some uh, Muslim students complaining vociferously about anything that, that, that reflects badly on Islam. Even when I was there, some undergraduates saying our drinking culture is racist. Well, alcohol is not against a race and there are plenty of um, Muslims who drink. Can I say you're not drinking culture is racist? Come on. Drinking is an essential part of my culture. So... You know, academics have never had lower status and they've been pushed around by undergraduates more. And not all undergraduates are bad to the dons at all. But um, yeah, it's all about bums on seats. Keep them there. Keep the money rolling in. Um, otherwise, your jobs are jeopardised. And um, bringing in these new subjects which have no corpus of knowledge, so therefore they can cut back. I mean, like chemistry, you can't do that without the per periodic table of elements. There's, there's a limit to which the traditional subjects can be dumbed down. The really new ones, cultural studies, media studies, what's that? Only invented in the 90s, and therefore they can dumb it down. There's really no floor to what they, they can um, dumb it down to. So, so much money is wasted on aesthetics. Student accommodation is better than ever, hotel standard. Now, that's a good thing, but that shouldn't be a priority for spending money. Obviously, it exacerbates the housing crisis, having these student halls which are only filled half the year. So those who perform terribly in school can still get a degree. I knew some 18-year-olds who were semi-literate who couldn't write a single sentence without write, making at least one mistake. And they go on to university and they get degrees. It's astonishing. You can fail all your A-levels and still be taken by some universities and still be awarded a degree and it wouldn't be a third. I mean, there's that, that old meme going around the USA a century ago. We taught uh, Latin university. Now it's remedial English. I lived in, from, Saudi, from Saudi Arabia for a few years in the huge homebrew industry. Right, yeah, I saw. Yeah, we used to do that when I was there. So, um, you know, Germany, Switzerland, the Netherlands, they all have graduation rates much lower than the United Kingdom, about 20%, and yet they have thriving economies. There is this myth by, by simply sending hordes of um, people to university that's necessarily going to boost our economy, and it's bogus. Georgia has got a very high university participation rate. Doesn't make it particularly prosperous. Okay, they've got to be degrees which are worthy degrees, which are difficult to get. Make it difficult to get in the first place. So people are really trying hard at school and don't make getting in almost guaranteed and have to resit if necessary to meet the high requisite standard. We haven't dumbed down in medicine, it seems, thank goodness. Imagine that attitude spread to medicine. Oh, we've got to pass anyway, and everyone. They paid the fees and we've got to get more and more in. No. I suppose because medicine is so expensive, you're paying £9,000 a year for the fees. The cost of you being there for the university is much higher, like £30,000 easily. The government pays the difference, pays that £21,000, and they don't want morons graduating as doctors and killing people by accident. Um, so that's the thing is, is 9000 is the maximum fee they're allowed to charge for students from the, from the European Union, including the UK. If you're from outside the European Union, it's more. Sorry, I should say it's where you live. If you live in the European Union for at least three years before you start university, it's then the, the home fee, the lower fee. Even if you're a citizen from China, if you'd lived in the UK for at least three years, you pay the home fee. If you're a British person who lived in China, going to UK university, you pay the overseas fee, the higher fee. Could be double easily. Have you ever taught anyone that's dyslexia? Have, do you recognize a condition? Yes, loads of people, but I can't talk about that right now. So some left-wing, well-meaning left-wing politicians in the 60s set the ball rolling. You know, they were sometimes the first generation to go to university. They wanted to spread this to other people. It was a praiseworthy goal, but they obviously went too far. We're overzealous. Um, so we've um, reduced the standards. People expect achieve less because less is expected again, uh, of them. It's like in a sport, you, you're, a good opposition raises your game. We demand you do better. So um, we, 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 a little failure is good for you in your teens, early 20s. Inoculate you against the 
um, a disappointment you'll necessarily feel in your working life, in your personal life. So the UK has superb universities, but few of them, some of them are decent, a few of them are mediocre, and a few of them are terrible. So they're truly scholastic subjects like veterinary medicine, medicine, architecture, um, and they haven't messed around with those. Um, standards for those subjects are high. Law really varies which subject it is. Plenty of moronic doctors I have had the pleasure of working with a few. I don't think they're moronic in maths and science. There might be in other regards. Um, so courses are dumbed down. They, they're gutted of content. Um, and, you know, let's say the old days translate German to English and, and, Ger and English to German. But sometimes they're scrapping translating into German. Only translating to in into English, a much easier task. No, they should insist on having to do it both directions. Uh, so we have we have things which are quite simply not academic subjects, like um, dance. I mean, dancing is not an academic thing. Not being rude about dancing is marvellous. I can't do it, but you shouldn't get a degree for it. And loads of things, and hair, hair makeup and beauty and hospitality and tourism and so on. The UK doesn't have enough people, graduates in STEM subjects. We should have more money for that, attract more people in, having to have lower standards in STEM subjects just to get people to do it. Um, anyway, so the Americanization of our higher education has been a problem. Commercialization, it's all about money. We'll take more people to get more money and then we'll pass them just to get more money and blah, blah, blah. Now, the United States, obviously, in a gigantic country, there's a huge diversity there of quality as well in universities, hundreds of colleges, some absolutely um, world beating and right down to some which are terrible. So it's a very corrupt system, sadly, as we've seen recently, this actress sent to jail for bribery and it's not an isolated case. The legatees accepted due to bribery. Oh, sorry, donations. As in just because his or her dad went there or gave money. Academic freedom was curtailed. Undergraduates demanding this or that. You can't say something controversial. So where's academic freedom gone? So there's this marriage of convenience between regressive uh, capitalism and uh, far-left cultural theory. Uh, it's an unholy alliance. So academics can't uh, um, you know, transgress certain mores or their career is over. The university is getting more expensive, but less worthwhile. So anyway, uh, what, what is to be done? Well, paying for it through general taxation would be all right, but there should be fewer places to be difficult to get. Um, and I can see why people say we don't want to be paying for all this bunkum, all this um, Marxist indoctrination. So uh, anyway, students should be allowed to get up to hijinks to, 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 to get drunk and so on. And that's absolutely fine. In the old days, Academics could have a romantic liaisons with their students, but now this is like a sacking offence. Um, so people are subjected to sub-Marxist and feminist indoctrination or in the UK taught not how to rape. Well, you know you're not supposed to do that. I, I, know, I find it demeaning and grossly insulting to be told that. So there's these loony left fads in the US as well, or this whole hoo-ha about sexual harassment. People are going to flirt. You're a grown-up. You accept that. Sometimes they say you don't, things you don't like, and we shouldn't be complaining here or there or some... Um, consensual sexual encounter. Well, I had one drink, therefore it didn't count. No, cry me a river. We should stop overreacting to this and just policing these personal interactions. Of, of course, rape is a crime. I don't want someone to be sexually assaulted, but if there's some sort of consensual contact and alcohol has been taken, I don't consider that sexual assault. Um, anyway, there's been great inflation in schools as well, GCSEs and A-levels. That's a whole other video. Republic of Ireland have not been too badly affected by that, actually. They, that's why in the UK they had to scrap the whole system for grading GCSEs and bring a numerical system in, return to what was there in the 70s, although they've done it the opposite way around. In the old days, one was the top, nine was the bottom. Now it's the other way around. Nine is the best, one is the worst. Um, so there's this permanent revolution. Nobody knows what the hell is happening. Um, and uh, so I remember seeing, who was it, Andrew Smith is Labour MP saying, when you graduated from university, you should be able to give a presentation, speak a bit of foreign language. I thought you should be able to do that when you do GCSEs, not a degree. Anyway, so some of these problems have been around for decades. Michael Gove, the UK Education Secretary, made a small attempt to reverse great inflation. There were howls of outrage. People were crying about it, emotionalising about it. But anyway, um, and he said, uh, tell, tell, tell a parent that 50% of children are below, below average. And I remember I told that to one woman who was genuinely perplexed. Of course they are. We should expect C grade to be the most typical grade because most of us are just satisfactory. In university, 2-1, probably 2-2 should be the most typical one. So the solution is to say we're only awarding first at the top 10%. You're not allowed to award to, to more and have that. Likewise, you know, A levels. If it's an A star, only 5% of people are allowed an A star. You can't increase it. OK, that was the rank order. The whole thing is to tell people our part, who's the top and who's the bottom. We can't all have a top grade or we'll have the bottom grade. There should be a spread. There's a bell curve, obviously. 
So not being too snooty about my abilities. If I was around the time of O-levels, I would have failed maths and Latin and other subjects. So anyway, so school grades are higher now, even though more people stay in school until the age of 18 than ever before. It just doesn't make the least bit of sense. So, I mean, I remember an academic from a London university told me these undergraduates will, will complain if they, if they don't get at least a 2-1. Or certainly since for almost 20 years in the UK, they've, um, uh, certainly Oxford did this sort of pre-term maths course because maths A-level wasn't demanding enough to prepare them for the course. And who'd be a teacher these days? Because you're going to get insulted, accused of racism, paedophilia by the time, verbally abused by your pupils, assaulted. No wonder there's a teacher recruitment crisis, especially in science, science subjects. I advise people not to go into it. So university education ought to be paired, paired back, but decently funded. No fees at all, grants for all, but for only for 20% of the population, max, 10% would be better. And then we know a degree was a real distinction. The rest could go in. People have seen the set of higher education scam for what it is, a bubble, the bubble's kind of bursting, and some companies are saying, just join us at 18 and work your way up, and you can do a degree part-time and we'll pay for it. And that's a much better model. The old days, accountants, even solicitors, didn't have to have degrees and, until the 90s, and now they do. Um, so uh, I think that was a retrograde step. So um, anyway, yeah, we need to have um, proper standards and make things reasonably tough, and actually just get firm on grade inflation even though people won't like it. That's my solution. And um, publicly fund funding of higher education is okay. I didn't really object to the £1,000 a year fee. 9000 I definitely object to. If it's a binary choice between £9,000 a year and zero, I choose zero. And people should pay more tax for that. But they make it very difficult to get in and make these things really demanding. Uh, I suppose, but like the Aquasol, my attitude is back to the 80s. Okay, goodbye. That's all I've got time for.